Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you for coming out on a, it was a beautiful day, but it, it looked like a kind of threatening a little rain this evening, but it's nice to see everyone. Thank you for uh, coming here to the Kellogg Hubbard Library. And thanks, thank you to the library and in particular to Michelle Singer um, for arranging this talk. I'm pleased to uh, be here in Montpelier to discuss uh, our new book, Olmsted and Yosemite, um, Civil, the Civil War, Abolition, and the National Park Idea. It's written uh, with my co-author, Ethan Carr, and it's a timely reinterpretation of the origins of the National Park Idea. So where did this idea for creating a system of national parks in the United States come from? Did it spontaneously arise from a campfire conversation on the Yellowstone Plateau in 1870? Uh, there's a reenactment uh, of that event um, on the left. Um, that was the official story for, I don't know how many years, Nora, 30, 40, 50 years? Uh, since proven largely erroneous, false. Or did it have something to do uh, with Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir? And they're, they're, they're standing together on Glacier Point in Yosemite Valley. In 1903, they met for one day in 1903, went camping that night. And um, if you watch the Ken Burns series episode on this camp, uh, camp story, it's, it's they obviously did a lot of talking, but national parks had been around for 30 years prior to that encounter. So that's not where the idea of national parks came from, despite uh, once this other story had been disproven uh, of the Yellowstone, it, this one became very popular. Um, and why are we talking this evening about Frederick Law Olmsted at all? He was a city park designer, right? What does he have to do with national parks? There's an image of Olmsted uh, on the lower left. And maybe the question we need to ask uh, most of all is how did this institution of public parks gain such a prominent place in our national imagination and public memory? Uh, to start, I think the term national park idea in our title might be, in fact, a bit misleading, to be honest. Because it's really, what we're really trying to talk about in our book is the idea of public parks, the public park idea. As it took shape in the mid-19th century, during, uh, before and during the American Civil War. Indeed, it was the broader idea of public parks that was the source of the national park idea, even if we choose to consider it a separate idea at all. And it was during this tumultuous period that the idea of public park, both in the nation's largest city, New York City, and in the remote Sierra Nevada of California, in fact, were established as a new institution in a remade American Republic. So Ethan and I wrote Olmsted in Yosemite to look specifically at Olmsted's park and conservation work in the context of the Civil War. And his steadfast allegiance to the 19th century Republican ideology of union, social improvement, and the abolition of slavery. The book offers a fresh perspective on the creation of national parks in the United States by connecting this parks movement to the dramatic transformation of the country brought about by the Civil War. <clears throat> Excuse me. It places uh, Yosemite Valley, California's Yosemite Valley, the first federally authorized park inspired by New York Central Park in the larger framework of war-related legislative and constitutional reforms that reshaped America. 
We were particularly intrigued by Olmsted's 1865 Yosemite report, which sought to explain the wider meaning of Yosemite's creation, its establishment as a park, and the future of public parks in a reuni reunited and reconstructed nation. As a journalist uh, extensively traveling through the antebellum South, American South, Olmsted wrote, it was the duty of every man, quote, the duty of every man to oppose slavery, to weaken it, and to destroy it. In his opinion, in fact, there was no greater impediment to the nation's progress than slavery. South Carolina Senator James Hammond had infamously declared on the floor of the United States Senate that cotton was king and that the absolute economic power of cotton would, quote, bring the whole world to our feet. And if economic power was not enough, violence would be used, even on the floor of the Senate, where in 1856, uh, Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner was nearly beaten to death by uh, South Carolina Congressman Preston Brooks. Before the Civil War, pro-slavery politicians in Washington were content with a relatively weak central government. Its limited responsibilities included delivering the US mail, protecting settlers on the frontier, and pursuing fugitive slaves. They preferred financing that small government through the sale of public land in lieu of taxation thus avoiding taxation on enormous wealth that had been accumulated through slave labor. In our book, we believe it is useful to look at uh, the passage of the Yosemite Act um, I, I will say this, though, uh, that uh, Had the, a bill or a proposal for Yosemite Park, uh, on God forbid, a larger, more, a much more uh, ambitious proposal for a two million acre Yellowstone Park been proposed in a pre-war Congress, it would have never made it. It would have ended up like other Republican proposals such as the college, the land grant college bill, here's the agricultural colleges, and the homestead bill would have ended up being vetoed. And they were vetoed by this man on the left, that's James Buchanan, the predecessor to Abraham Lincoln. Um, if, in fact, um, park bills had made it to the floor of the Congress. Southern Democrats committed to unrestricted expansion of slavery would have viewed setting aside public land for conservation or recreation with, as an anathema and would have fought, fought it tooth and nail. And it's quite likely that um, both uh, any proposal for Yosemite and any proposal for uh, later on for Yellowstone would have, in fact, never occurred or never would have been passed. I think it's useful, if, uh, if I may, to make a comparison to illustrate this opposition or likely opposition to park bills by taking up uh, a piece of legislation introduced by our own senator at that time, Congressman Justin Morrill, and that was the College Land Grant Act. We know of the College Land Grant Act from his 1862 bill that became law, but that was the second, that was the reincarnation, that was the second effort. The first effort, the first land grant bill for colleges was introduced in 1858 into Congress. 
And we think the reaction to a Parks bill would have been very similar to the reaction to the land-grant colleges. Um, in fact, uh, we stay with this. Uh, when Morrill uh, introduced legislation in, in 1858, um, Senator Clement Clay of Alabama, who was leading the Democratic opposition to the legislation, denounced the bill, and I quote, as one of the most monstrous, iniquitous, and dangerous measures ever introduced into Congress. He said, in fact, if the people demand the patronage of the federal government for agriculture and education, it is because they have become debauched and led astray. He went on to describe the bill as a magnificent bribe to encourage Alabama to, quote, surrender to the federal power her original and reserved right to manage her own domestic and internal affairs. And you can read slavery. Alabama Congressman Williamson Cobb declared, uh, in fact, that this would be a dangerous precedent being set and said that uh, using public lands um, to, to generate revenue in lieu of, um, that, excuse me, that the use of uh, public lands uh, in, um, to do anything but generate revenue in lieu of taxes, to use them for any other public purpose, uh, would be a huge mistake um, and another Southern congressman declared that such grants would, uh, quote, only be the beginning of giving away public lands till none are left to give. Now, the same year that Morrill uh, introduced his first version of his College Land Grant Act, um, Frederick Law Olmsted and, and Calvert Vaux completed their design for Central Park in New York City. Both the proposal for agricultural colleges in every state and the creation of a great public park in the, in the largest city of the nation were defiant acts challenging a weak national government constrained by the demands of slavery. When Central Park was first opened, in 1858, that year, it was described in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine as, quote, the most striking evidence of the sovereignty of the people in the history of free institutions. The best answer yet given to the doubts and fears which have frowned upon the theory of self-government. Olmsted himself described Central Park as a democratic development of the highest importance. Our book was inspired by Sarah Blake Shaw, a social reformer and abolitionist whose words uh, serve as an epigram for our story. In 1861, soon after the Civil War began, she wrote a letter to Frederick Law Olmsted. And in that letter, she said, if we can, quote, if we can remake the government, abolish slavery, and get, cent get Central Park well underway for our descendants, we shall have done a work worthy of the 19th century and ought to be willing to suffer. Now, uh, those words were not rhetorical. Her suffering certainly was not rhetorical. Two years later, uh, her 25-year-old son, Robert Gould Shaw, commander of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, died alongside more than 100 black soldiers attacking Fort Wa Wagner outside of Charleston Harbor. But Shaw was already looking beyond victory on the battlefield to a future that would justify the terrible war that was unfolding before her eyes. In her letter, she framed the conflict as an opportunity to reinvent the nation and replace a political system that had long sanctioned slavery. Her vision was also remarkably associated with a great public park, an achievement that was representative of the kind of civic progress that she hoped for the whole nation. 
the title of Olmsted's best known book uh, on the slave states uh, called The Cotton Kingdom was in fact an ironic reference to those words of James Hammond, Cotton is King. The book included an unusual map, which uh, is shown on the right, which uh, displayed the population of enslaved people by county in the South. A derivation of that map was later used during the Civil War by none other than Abraham Lincoln to guide the recruitment of formerly enslaved freedmen into the ranks of the United States Army. Um, and uh, you can see from the, uh, the, the portrait on, on the lower left, that's, that's a Francis Bicknell Carpenter painting of Lincoln uh, meeting with his cabinet. Um, where the arrow has been inserted, you can see actually he included a copy of that very map that's above. in effect, documentary proof of how useful it was. Um, Olmsted clearly understood, and he wrote in the New York Times, essentially an opt-ed, um, that black resistance and self-emancipation in large numbers would hollow out the Confederacy and accelerate its collapse. This great movement of freed people uh, illustrated on the upper right, uh, that's a wayside exhibit uh, uh, at Fort Pulaski on the coast of Georgia, if anyone has ever been there. Um, uh, this great movement of freed people and their new alliance with federal armies would place enormous pressure on the Lincoln administration to accelerate plans for emancipation. Once you had thousands and then tens of thousands and ultimately hundreds of thousands of people who would not be moving back into slavery, that was clear. Time was, uh, time, the time had come to move on emancipation. Um, Self-emancipation was already occurring in, in large numbers. And it became clear also in Congress that there would be no negotiated settlement to this war. There'd be no uh, putting the genie back in the bottle, no, no return to a pre-war status quo. And of course, all the Southern Democrats had left Congress, so the Republicans now had a majority in both houses, and they were prepared to use that majority. Uh, Congress en engineered an extraordinary expansion of the national government, both to win the war, but also to change the Republic. Congress and the Lincoln administration sought to build a more activist republic focused on improvements that served large numbers of people. Legislation was uh, passed um, in the spring of 1862. In fact, I, uh, there was a period in 1862 from, the, from uh, probably about March of 1862 to, the, to, to about August about five months, more or less, that was a remarkable transformation of the United States. Legislation was passed for a national banking and revenue system, first ever in the United States, the creation of a Department of Agriculture, and land grants for railroads, homesteading, and education, including the reintroduction and finally the passage of the College Land Grant Act. The capstone, what has been called as our second American Revolution, was congressional authorization for the recruitment of black soldiers into the United States Army, followed by Lincoln's release of his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Taken as a whole, these measures reaffirmed the efficacy and value of Republican government and the necessity of defending it. Now, in 1864, Congress granted Yosemite Valley to the state of California to create a public park. It did so as Olmsted declared, quote, in trust for the entire nation. The act was yet another land grant. Like the College, uh, College Land Grant Act, it was a modest but eventually consequential 
part of the same wave of wartime legislation. Now, for many years, uh, historians have been at a loss to explain the Yosemite Act because they, they, they just can't figure out the timing of, his pa of its passage. It seems like such an anomaly in the middle of the war. Why ever would you uh, take time out of dealing with this national emergency to pass a bill like this, to create this small 850-acre res reservation in the mountains of California? Uh, on the contrary, we believe that, uh, in fact, this was in, uh, just like the College Land Grant Act and many other uh, pieces of legislation, this was another component of wartime legislation that fun fundamentally remade the United States into a nation without enslaved people, that preserved the republic, and in fact, allowed it to assume a better form. Um, Lincoln, uh, at the time, said, uh, he, you know, looking at this, looking at all the things being done in the midst of the war, said that if the rebellion, in fact, the insurrection, in fact, could interfere with the continuity and functioning of constitutional government, quote, it might fairly claim to have already conquered and ruined us. Now, the Republic was still deeply flawed. The subjugation of Native Americans never abated during, by, during the war. But at least the country was moving to still unattained ideals that the nation had been founded on. Uh, now, working in California, Olmsted was asked to draft a report on the future of Yosemite as a public park. And he used this opportunity, he seized this opportunity to explain the wider meaning and significance of this act. Now, the Yosemite Act drew its inspiration from Central Park. And the purpose of the new park and the justifications for the government to act in making it, in fact, were, just as Olmsted explained, entirely consistent with what he described for Central Park just a few years earlier. Both parks demonstrated the Republic's ability to meet the needs of large numbers of its citizens. Even as it was being denounced by monarchists in Europe and violently attacked by secessionists at home. But it must be said that without a final Union victory, and I might add the re-election of Abraham Lincoln in 1864, a victory that was aided by the, ultimately by the service of almost 180,000 black soldiers. Legislation for Yellowstone and the early national parks that followed it, based on that template of Yosemite, might never have been enacted. And this is uh, a recruitment poster for uh, uh, African-American soldiers on the upper left, and that's the Grand Victory Parade down Pennsylvania Avenue at the conclusion of the war. And of course, images of both Yosemite Valley and the Yellowstone Falls. Now, what happened to this story? And what happened to the story is almost as interesting as the story itself. Uh, in fact, this narrative of uh, Yosemite and the Civil War and uh, the changes to America then were largely erased in the early 20th century. That story was um, largely disappeared. And there was an effort to distance national parks from any association with the trauma and controversy of the Civil War and its aftermath, Reconstruction. Much of the country had, in fact, embraced white reconciliation. And there you have uh, two gentlemen at the uh, 1913 Gettysburg reunion, the Peace Jubilee, they called it. Uh, and uh, a lost cause narrative 
that nostalgically glamorized the old South and rehabilitated leaders of the Confederacy had largely become public memory, the new public memory. Uh, Jim Crow legislation and practices, in fact, reversed many of the hard-fought civil rights gains made during Reconstruction. This happened as political momentum was just building for the creation of a professional bureau, a national park service, to manage a growing portfolio of national parks in the early 20th century. Uh, this is, uh, there's a picture of uh, a movie poster, Rick, from Birth of a Nation. Um, that was premiered or shown in the White House at the time. Uh, and of course, we're all familiar with Gone with the Wind, um, which was hugely, had a huge impact uh, on propagating the lost cause. As uh, David Blight uh, said in his book, Race and Reunion, the segregated society required a segregated historical memory. And even the Park Service, um, when they were establishing new parks in the South, adhered to the local custom. So if the state parks were segregated, the national parks were segregated too. And that's a sign from Shenandoah National Park, uh, uh, the bottom left, uh, Lewis Mountain Campground, uh, the Negro Campground, and of course, you know, everything else was segregated as well, restroom facilities. And Shenandoah wasn't the only park. There were a handful of parks that, in fact, were segregated at least until the early 1940s. And even the Lincoln Memorial, when it was dedicated in 1922, the event had segregated seating for all the attendees. So it was not really surprising that early National Park Service supporters and leaders steered clear of any reference to Olmsted or the Yosemite report. Olmsted, in fact, himself, he was too closely identified with Central Park when the new parks were being marketed as a concept born in the rugged east, not the urban east. No, excuse me, the rugged west, not the urban east. And he was too well known for writing books that forcibly condemned the Old South uh, and he was too closely identified with anti-slavery and union sediment when the Civil War was being reinterpreted through the lens of the lost cause. Campfire tales attributing the national park idea to the rugged explorers or heroic conservationists, on the other hand, carried no such baggage. Um, Teddy Roosevelt and uh, John Muir, in fact, uh, you know, they discussed many things that night. And most likely they were discussing the future of Yosemite, which would unite, there was a, a national part of the park and there was still the state reservation. So bringing it all together didn't occur to 1906. Um, and no doubt that that was for, for, foremost uh, conversation item that night. But Olmsted, uh, excuse me, Roosevelt was in fact, um, a little boy when Yosemite was created. And uh, the national parks, even though John Muir is often credited as being the father of the National Park Service, he in fact had, had died um, several years before the legislation was in fact to create a National Park Service in 1916 was passed. Uh, but these, uh, stories served as a comfortable and affirming park creative narrative that was unencumbered by any reference to an activist government working on behalf of freedom, equity, and the remaking of the republic. But if the new parks represented a commitment to public well-being, the public did not include everyone. The establishment of a park in Yosemite Valley would follow the dispossession a decade earlier of the Miwok people and others from their valley homes. Early writers who described Yosemite Valley as untrammeled wild nature willfully overlooked countless generations of human occupation. Um, 
indigenous people were never included, uh, uh, were, were never the beneficiaries of Lincoln's new birth of freedom. As they were forced out of their ancestral homes by, in fact, uh, making room to expedite Republican policies. Uh, this injustice, in fact, must be acknowledged in any conversation about conservation legacy. So looking back at the Yosemite report and Olmsted's long career in park making, what can we infer about his involvement then and his continuing influence today? First, the Civil War and the social revolution it fueled enabled the public park to emerge as part of our national identity and an essential institution of American democracy. In the Yosemite report, Olmsted warned against the monopolization, and I quote, of the choicest natural scenes in the country and the means of recreation connected with them by a very, very few rich people, end quote. Olmsted affirmed every person's entitlement to enjoy the nation's most spectacular places. And he created an intellectual framework for a system of national parks, and more generally, a framework for the American parks movement uh, that would be established at every level of government. In the report, Olmsted asserted that the establishment by government of great public grounds for the free enjoyment of its people was in fact justified as a political duty. He believed that a government had a compelling obligation to support these great public parks on an equal footing with all its other major duties. And he hoped for a government acting on behalf, quote, of equity and benevolence. A bloody civil war had been fought reaffirming the legitimacy of national sovereignty. With the adoption of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution, the federal government positioned itself to be the guarantor of civil rights, including the right to vote. That had previously been the responsibility of state governments to interpret and restrict as they saw fit. This expanded national authority would be further extent, extended by the uh, creation of a two million acre Yellowstone National Park in 1872. The government felt confident enough to not only create a large reservation, but in fact to manage it. Olmsted had pressed for a guarantee of pro broad public access to these great parks and public reservations for public health, for recreation, and general well being. And this, in fact, was realized to par in part uh, when, and finally in 1916, um, the National Park Service Organic Act was, uh, was codified creating the national parks. This access, he believed, was a right of citizenship rather than a prerogative of wealth or influence. And finally, Olmsted believed, as Abraham Lincoln did, that it was appropriate for a republic to level the playing field. He appealed for the pursuit of happiness against all obstacles. Just as Lincoln spoke of the Civil War, quote, as a struggle for maintaining in the world that form and substance of government whose leading object is to elevate the condition of men. So why is this important today? Well, Ethan and I make the case in our book for linking early national park and conservation history to the broader struggle for freedom, equity, and democracy in the United States. Having a more contextual and inclusive founding narrative that also acknowledges the enduring connection of indigenous people to these lands will enable more communities to see themselves as part of this legacy and it will create a, continue to create a more diverse system of national parks and public lands that are representative of the collective experience of all Americans. Thanks. So we have 
think we have lots of time for questions. Great. Yes. What was Olmstead doing in California? Olmstead <laughs> um, uh, had served for the first three years of the war as executive director of something called the U.S. Sanitary Commission, which was um, the it was a, a quasi-private effort to to deal with the inadequacies of the U.S. medical uh, U.S. Army Medical Bureau, and to really take care of wounded U U U.S. soldiers. And he was, he ran this, and he ran himself into the ground doing so. Um, there's a, a book called uh, The Republic of Suffering uh, by Drew Gilpin Faust. Um, that's an Olmsted line. He talked about the Republic of Suffering because he saw it, uh, suffering up, uh, up close and personal for many years. Um, but he, it was a very uh, highly, um, uh, contentious job, uh, and the, all the there were various branches of the sanitary commission that wanted to break off and do you know wanted to hold on to money that was raised. There were all sorts of issues. Plus, Olmsted really had very low patience for dealing with the army medical people, um, and eventually he just had it. He had applied for a job. Um, I'm sorry to give you so much background, but he had applied for a job to attempt to work, to run the first effort, experiment in reconstruction, which occurred uh, at Port Royal in South Carolina. Uh, and he didn't get that job. He really, he was pining for most of the er, year, early years of the war. He wanted to be superintendent of what was called contraband, which was the superintendent of, in charge of dealing with all the African-American freedmen who had come into Union, through Union lines. And he felt he was, because of his travels to the South and his administrative skills, that he was the perfect person to do this. But he never got that job. And finally, he, he felt he had burned too many bridges with the Lincoln administration. And in uh, late 1963, after the Battle of Gettysburg, he went to California. And he uh, took a job um, uh, running a, a, a mining operation in the Sierra foothills. Uh, he was in a reasonably good administrator, and he'd proven himself. Uh, so he was in California. It was a foregone, uh, no foregone, it was a forlorn uh, enterprise from start to finish. It was going, it was basically going bankrupt, and um, slowly. And Olmsted was looking for other work, and in fact did some uh, small park jobs out in the greater Bay Area of California. And when Yosemite was created, when the legislation went through in Washington, they had written into the bill that there would be a commission that would plan for its future. And um, Olmsted's name, of course, went right to the top because he was well known at that point. Central Park was behind him. I mean, he thought that maybe that was a one-off and he was gonna go on to other things in life. And he certainly did through the Sanitary Commission, through um, running a mine. Uh, but in fact, he was the, he was the, one of the, it was co-creator of Central Park. And people knew about this. And so he was tapped to run, essentially chair this commission and to write this report. But he didn't write a report about the, a, he didn't do a plan for Yosemite really. I mean, the plan for Yosemite out of 26 pages, the plan for Yosemite is about four pages. The rest of it, he just seized the opportunity to really talk about the future of the country when the war was over. He wrote most of this uh, on the cusp of the surrender at Appomattox and the end of the war. He was thinking about what was next for the United States and wanted to position public parks as a, as a key institution for a, a reconstructed nation. So he, he was there, he was, in fact, he was only half a day ride from Yosemite Valley where he was. So he was perfectly positioned. He didn't stay out there very long after the report was completed. He went, he was enticed back east by his partner, his former partner, uh, Calvert Vox, 
uh, because they had gotten the uh, commission, he, Vox had landed the commission to do Prospect Park, the great park in Brooklyn. And he desperately wanted Olmsted to come back uh, east and help him with that. And he, he really was getting pretty angry with Olmsted towards the end. He, he wrote Olmsted that, um, Olmsted at that time was even uh, contemplating uh, becoming the editor-in-chief of the new Nation magazine. And, um, and, and Vox writes him a letter and says, you can find somebody else to write for the nation. And you can, you can dig up all the gold in the world, and you still won't be doing the, what you really should be doing. He was on the Stanford campus. Stanford was later in his career. When he came back east, it launch, he launched, he re, re, um, launched his landscape design career um, and never really got back involved, too deeply involved in um, either Reconstruction or what followed in terms of the civil rights for African Americans. I and mean, he was just going parks like uh, gangbusters. And so Stanford was one of many campuses he worked on, but it was the successor firm, his sons, who did the Olmsted did a prodigious amount of works, but it pales in comparison to the successor firm. That's another story. Yes? Um, so as a landscape architect, I've heard of quite a bit about Olmsted, but um, this has been interesting. I mean, I have known about his views on slavery and his, his uh, travels and as a reporter in the South and his reports back and of course about the Yosemite. This was interesting in um, connecting it to the um, to the whole the Civil War. I mean, this is sort of I was aware of the time in general, but to think about what had opened up the possibilities at that particular time to to do that. That that's well, the war opened a lot of possibilities. In fact, the, the you know basic uh, thesis of the book is that it changed the United States forever. It, you know, it didn't change it enough, but it changed the trajectory. So one of the things that, that I was sort of, sort of taught is about the, the, the beginning of the Clark movement was that it began, this is sort of not exact, with Mount Auburn Cemetery, because at that time, people, the common person, had no first place the outdoors and the outdoors, I mean, it's being considered healthy in, in dense cities in particular. And um, so the, there were there were this there was this cemetery that instead of just being rows of gravestones was curving paths and and recreational. Cities, and people could would come on Sundays to stroll, and it, it sort of opened up the idea of a place for ordinary person who couldn't afford property to have a place where they could... You're, you're, you're all right on every point. Uh, and, and, you know, to some degree, because this is a limited talk, I, I condensed, <laughs> you know, I really didn't get into the early history and the, the rural cemeteries movement and the cemeteries movement is very important to the idea, the concept of parks. But what Olmsted does and Vox, what they do is really take it to scale. So that you're talking about large m municipal parks. I mean, there was the country had never seen anything like Central Park. I mean, it was just stunned by it. Still is. Still is. It's just you know, it's 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 being discussed for World Heritage, because it's not only of national significance, but in fact, the argument is that it's of universal humankind significance. Um, so it, that's what they did. They were able to institutionalize it, if you will. And then, of course, they moved on from big parks to park systems. And Olmsted sort of pioneered that to a degree with the Emerald Necklace in Boston and the Buffalo Parks, if you're familiar with them. And his sons then, that became their calling card, was not to do individual parks, but do whole network or park systems. Yeah, the Emerald Necklace Jeff. 
Yosemite. Yeah, Yosemite. The Sierra, the Sierra and Parks. Uh, and I wonder if you would say a little bit more about their presence and their their importance in that those early years. Well, uh, we uh, it we we do mention it in the book a little bit. It's it's um, the federal government's or Congress's uh, appetite for parks, national parks, um, exceeded its capacity, the capacity of the, of the government to, to manage them. Um, and and, and what the, gov the, the, the argument we make is that the Civil War really pushed the government to expand and to um, do a lot of things that it had never done before, but it lacked capacity in many cases. And particularly after the war ended, then the money sort of diminished and, and the, uh, the emergency uh, certainly uh, was not as acute. Um, so, but they had ambitions. For example, Southern Reconstruction. Congress took over Reconstruction in uh, the late 1860s and early years of the 1870s and attempted to make it work uh, and enforce it. Uh, uh, and, um, and they created something called the Freedmen's Bureau, which was set up to do things the government had never done before. It was to set up schools. It was to uh, help with some limited land re redistribution. It was to uh, help with court systems. It was essentially to build civic infrastructure for a, a, a Southern society which had never seen very much of it and was prostate after the end of the war and was also, uh, there was, there were, you know, three or four million new um, to be new citizens, who uh, so the government was trying to help that transition from enslavement to freedom, and they created the Freedmen's Bureau to 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 help with that process. They had they couldn't figure out how to staff it, um, so they turned to the United States Army, and they went they turned to the army in a, in a peacetime because the army at least was number one it was organized it was paid for and it was trained and they and people could follow orders so um in fact i i've never written this up but the first superintendent of schools in the city of new orleans was a vermonter uh from the seventh vermont regiment uh who had who had um actually worked um who had been in the Seventh Vermont, in, in which served, which was stationed in Louisiana, and he later volunteered to be in um, to be a officer in the U.S. Colored Infantry. Um, an interesting fact, uh, just parenthetically, since you bring this up, is that um, a surprising number of uh, privates or non-commissioned officers, not, not non-commissioned officers, not even officers, not even sergeants. These were uh, privates in the Vermont unit in, in Louisiana were offered commissions if they would uh, work with colored units, the U.S. colored troops, they were called in that point in time. And a surprising number of like 60 or 70 of them chose, took the promotion. And a few of them stayed behind to work for the Freedmen's Bureau. And so it changed the trajectory of their lives. Um, and a few of them, in fact, were killed by the Klan uh, working for the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, anyway, so the government used the army for all sorts of things, but they used it um, to staff the national parks. There was no professional Bureau of National Parks. There were, there were, you know, a few people in the Interior Department in Washington. They weren't going to help you very much. Um, so the solution, because the parks were under assault, like uh, Yellowstone, for example, people were just going in and destroying the, the thermal, hydrothermal features. They were poaching uh, wildlife. It was sort of a free-for-all because there, there was a nominal superintendent but no staff. So they ordered the Army in to basically protect the parks. Um, and the army, um, the parks in California, the Sierra parks, which includes Yosemite, Sequoia, and Kings Canyon, those parks were pretty close to the Presidio in San Francisco. 
And it was, the Presidio had the uh, uh, U.S. Cavalry, uh, black units of the U.S. Cavalry stationed there, and they sent them into the national parks. And those were called, this, they were called at the time, Buffalo Soldiers. And they were, in fact, the first custodians, park rangers, if you will, of those national parks. And the, uh, the Park Service does a very good job of interpreting uh, this, their story. My only uh, beef with the national parks is that they could do a better job in making the connection of these Buffalo Soldiers to the U.S. colored soldiers who were, were created during the Civil War. And they would never have been Buffalo Soldiers if, it, if the United States had not enlisted black soldiers to win the war. And um, those units, uh, there was even one of those units uh, stationed at, um, right here at Fort Ethan Allen. Um, well, that's another story. Yes. You know, a, lot, a number of historians have claimed it to be Olmsted's. We found no evidence whatsoever, and we say it's likely was not. Uh, he, he, um, he didn't even visit Yosemite Valley until uh, months after the legislation was passed and signed. So I don't think, he, he, he may have inspired it to some degree, and Central Park certainly was an, a, a, a huge inspiration. But Olmsted didn't draft the legislation. So who, did, who introduced that legislation? You know, it's, it's, it's still not entirely clear, and we looked pretty closely at it, but it was introduced by a representative of a steamship company, um, a guy named Raymond, who, was, um, who probably wanted to promote Yosemite as a destination, because it was getting better known particularly after um, a Bierstadt visited Yosemite. If you've been up to St. John's, Johnsbury Athenaeum, you're certainly familiar with his stunning, uh, but he, he painted Yosemite many, many times. He made a lot of money off of Yosemite Valley, Bierstadt. It's very popular. Uh, in fact, uh, during the Civil War, big cities held something called sanitary fairs which were fundraisers for the Sanitary Commission, this Red Cross type organization. And they would be enormous kind of world fair type events that would go on for a week and the revenue would go to the wounded soldiers in the Sanitary Commission. Well, they, the, big, the big ones in Boston and Philadelphia and uh, New York City had big art galleries where people could buy art and uh, raising money, uh, so the art would be discounted or would be donated. The most expensive painting, the painting that got the most revenue, sold for the highest amount in New York City, was a Bierstadt of Yosemite Valley. So it was becoming popularized. It was also popularized by a gentleman named Carlton Watkins, who was a photographer. And Watkins had gotten into the valley very early in 1861 and had created a portfolio of what they call mammoth, uh, mammoth uh, photographs. They were huge. Um, um, and he, that portfolio had gotten east. He, there were people who, you know, you asked me about who, who really pushed Yosemite. There were people who wanted to see this protected. And so they arranged for this. I, at that time, you know, you couldn't FedEx. Uh, a, a portfolio of photographs. I mean, they had to go through the, uh, the, Cat, uh, the Isthmus of Panama overland, and then they had to be shipped. Uh, God only knows how they got these photographs, but they got east into people's hands. They, um, influential people got copies, and um, congressmen. There was a, a, a set of photographs in this Senate sergeant at arms had. So these photographs were, were hugely influential, even more so than Bierstadt's painting. And um, so, you know, who was responsible? Well, Raymond certainly wrote a letter to the, 
senator from California, a guy named Connus. And Connus agreed immediately to introduce legislation. And Raymond made sure that Connus included the words uh, in perpetuity, set aside in perpetuity. So that was the spark for national parks, that this was not a one-off just for you know one point in time. Um, Connus at some point says, "Oh, the uh, you know I was you know trying to help out influential people in California." Olmsted uh, has the last word, even though he wasn't on the front end of the discussion. The Yosemite report essentially was a chronicle of the whole thing, and he says, "No, this was not a, a, a it's not just serving a few uh, influential people." He said, "This was." in place in trust for the entire nation. And uh, you know, he, he seizes upon that opportunity to talk about what its broader meaning was above the political fray.